My name is Steve Hayes. I'm a Foundation Professor and Director of Clinical Training in the Department of Psychology at the University of Nevada in Reno, where I've been for about 30 years. Uh, what I'm known for is, uh, on the one hand, work in acceptance, mindfulness, and values, um, summarized under an approach called acceptance and commitment therapy, or when it's used in an organizational context, acceptance and commitment training. And in either case, it's called ACT, uh, not, by the way, ACT, uh, which always reminds me of ECT, and I don't like the association. You know. <laughs> the, uh, underneath the ACT work is uh, a body of work uh, on a theory I've developed of language and cognition called relational frame theory, which uh, helps explain where language come from, comes from, how it evolved, how it functions, how it works. Uh, and it's part of a larger effort to try to marry up the behavioral sciences that are focused more on context and history uh, with uh, the evolution sciences, and that's called contextual behavioral science. So it's a, a body of work, and there's a group of worldwide about, right now, 7,400 people, about half of the members outside of the U.S., who are part of the association that is developing this work. As it goes forward, it's not just focused on ACT per se, but the compassion-focused therapy uh, people, the mindfulness-based uh, therapies uh, in general, and increasingly some of the applied evolutionists are part of our uh, community. So it's an interesting community and one that has direct relevance to uh, coaching, I believe, because uh, unlike a lot of uh, methods that are out there, it's not based on the psychology of the abnormal, but the psychology of the normal, and which makes it uh, applicable to really all of us. Every, anywhere a human mind goes, how we want to go That's there. a nice phrase. Um, can you, I'm just curious, tell me a little bit about how you came to this and to this work, if you can. Well, the ACT work was a combination of a professional story and a personal story. The, the professional story is trying to give, bring together some of my earliest interests in Maslow and peak experiences and uh, Esalen, and I'm a child of the 60s, so I have yeah, all of those things. <laughs> yeah. um, and all things Eastern in the form of things like Suzuki and Watts and things like that. I grew up in California, sat on Hippie Hill, and just did more chemicals than I should. Uh, so you're looking at uh, a, a grown-up, old, long hair hippie dude. Uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I always uh, thought that the parts inside uh, the human potential movement and human growth, existentialism, humanism, etc., that were important had to be sifted through a more scientific body uh, approach. And I was attracted early on uh, to the behavior analytic uh, wing of psychology. I was a Skinnerian and still am in many ways, although uh, once you really get serious about cognition, some of the things that happen inside behavioral psychology uh, changes. And all of that was before I developed a panic disorder as a young assistant professor, and that really knocked me flat. Um, and I found that when I went through my CBT training and even some of my uh, behavior therapy training, it didn't really seem to have much power against what I was facing, which increasingly restricted my life to the point that it was very hard for me to go into elevators, to travel by car, to go to restaurants, to answer the phone. I mean, just really basic things, never mind giving a lecture in a class. That was uh, terrifying. Really restrictive things. Very restrictive and very quick. I mean, it happened over a two or three year period that I went from, um, you know, being a person who really wanted to travel and give talks and participate to one where uh, I was trying to shuff, shuffle everything off to my students so they'd do it rather than me. Um, it wasn't until I turned back to this more Eastern uh, part of my history and uh, some of the more uh, humanistic ideas, and gestalt ideas, and human potential movement uh, that I really found some traction on my own personal problems. And as I pulled that in, uh, and began to use these I, some of my preliminary ideas that I worked out with myself, uh, with my clients, because I was known for working with anxiety disorders. So I had a lot of clients who had those issues uh, uh, in my practice, and the same thing happened there. So that just really, uh, I thought, was curious. I did a few randomized trials in the early 80s, three, actually one in pain, one in weight control, and one in depression. 
We published the one in the press and the other two we put in the file drawer. They only came out much, much later, 15, 20 years later. And I kind of um, uh, thought, we, if we're going to put these Eastern ideas out there into evidence-based therapy, we better have our ducks in a row. Yeah. And so I spent 15 years developing relational frame theory, some of the underlying philosophy and theory, the components, the measures, etc. We, we published no outcome research until I published the book uh, called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy in 1999. And from then until now, we've uh, had more than 100 randomized trials. 60% of the body of work on ACT has happened in the last four years. Uh, and it's because there's a worldwide community who are interested in it, and we function as a community. It's not top-down. It's very communitarian, open, penetrable, non-hierarchical. We try to put into our organization the principles we try to put into other people's lives through our work. And that draws really high quality minds to the work who uh, have, have uh, pulled me along. So I'm, not, I'm no longer in control of the things that I help start. Can you, um, can you go back a little bit and give me a definition of your relational frame theory? Yeah. I get it uh, I'm glad you asked the question, and I'll try not to be too geeky. But what we've d discovered, I think really you could use the word discovery for that, is that the uh, core of human language, the thing, if you don't have this element, you don't develop normal human language or even barely functional uh, in the way we normally think about it. I mean, you can have things that look like human language, but they're more like what would happen with a dog or a cat. And there are some children who never do develop uh, due to neurological problems or whatever. But the core of it, it happens around age 12 months, is that we learn to derive relationships in both directions between symbols and objects to combine them into networks and to change the functions of everything that's in the network as a result of the relations that exist and the cues that exist about what functions are of importance. So for example, if you train a chimpanzee, a dog, a dolphin, etc., that in the presence of an object to, uh, to uh, pick, let's say, a sign or to say something or to respond to a, an oral name, if you then flip it in the other direction, the animal will respond to chance levels. They may know that uh, that's called a banana, or this sign for a banana has, or picking this chip is what you have to do depending on how they do the particular thing. But when you flip it around and then without training present the chip or sign or sound, the animal won't orient towards the object. Now, babies will by 12 months. And we know some of the history because we've actually done the early work of it's happening naturally, of course, mothers and fathers are doing this, but you, know, you can manipulate it. Uh, and so What's of importance about that clinically? Uh, well, several things. We're able to do, we have better implicit cognition measures than anyone on the planet. And I'm sorry for the self-praise, but we just do. And Don't the, apologize. The, the studies that have been done, and we can do a lot better than these more associationistic uh, models of cognition. We can take kids who don't have normal language and we can accelerate their language development. We can take normal kids, or recent randomized trials, a year of training and the underlying relational uh, fabric of language and their kids' IQs went up by 15 points. Um, so we, we, when you know what the core of something is, in the history of science, you're able to do things with it. Clinically and in coaching, what's important are there's some, some broader insights before you dive do a deep dive. Part of it is, if language is learned behavior, there is no, there's nothing in learning as a field called unlearning doesn't exist. There's inhibition. And so a lot of the things that we do where we're really trying to erase or eliminate um, thoughts that we've had or logical conclusions we've reached or it really is a fool's errand and it's unnecessary because that's not the way it works. Uh, if you inhibit a response later on when something you've learned is now no longer successful, you'll go back through your repertoire and, you, and these things will reemerge. They never leave your history. So if you've ever had like an irrational thought, under certain conditions you're going to think that thought the rest of your life. I don't care how much work you do detecting it, challenging it, disputing it, and changing it. Some of that just builds the network. There's even more avenues into it. So for example, if you take someone like me with my panic disorder, by the time I was finished building it out, doing the natural, normal, reasonable, pathological things that people do when they have emotions they don't like, thoughts they don't like, almost any 
uh, cue could lead to the concept of anxiety and produce anxiety rushes, uh, including words like relaxation, uh, emotion, uh, you know, just anything would remind me of. Uh, and, and this is just a normal human process, but it's not logical, it's psychological, and people don't know that that's how the mind works. No, I, I would guess, I don't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. I'm trying to pull it in, it, that it's extremely individualized, and what's going to trigger you for words or experience or environment is entirely different and unconnected to what's going to trigger me. The details are individualized, but the process is shared by us all, which is why if you get a group of folks together who've struggled with panic, let's say, you start having them tell their stories, pretty soon you're looking around and you realize it's the same story. I mean, the details have changed, but it's the same story. And it's because it's kind of an evolutionary mismatch. I mean, really what we're dealing with is, you know, tantamount to, uh, uh, you know, I have a picture of a duckling, uh, uh, a duckling's following a mama duck, and the mama duck walks across a sewer grate, and of course the ducklings fall in. Um, you know, we do that. We just take these normal processes that are not very old, they're 100,000, 200,000, they can't be more than two and a half million years old because we split off from the chimps two and a half million years ago and they don't do it. So maybe the early hominids do what you and I are doing right now. If it's just Homo sapiens, we're talking about you know, an eye blink of 100,000 years. And that's not enough time to really figure out how to manage something. So it's not by accident that we call our problems things like mental problems. I mean, we are dealing with this. We're kind of riding the tiger of human language and cognition and often it runs us rather than us running it. Uh, I was thinking coming down on the uh, elevator about, it just came to mind, I don't know why, the fact that we call um, you know, unfair uh, bosses of countries, we call them dictators, the speakers. Yeah. And yet we're being dictated to, spoken to by our own minds all the time and led around as if by a leash. And really what the act work is about is how to put your mind on a leash instead of have your, your mind putting you on a leash. It's part of you. It's a useful tool. I'm glad we have it. I don't want to be my little dog, uh, D.O.G. Uh, she wouldn't survive very well without the humans taking care of her. But, uh, you know, your mind will walk you off the edge of a cliff. Uh, I mean, as an example, just a, th a thought of that. You look at 65% of the suicide notes say, when I'm dead, I won't hurt. As far as we know, that's true. It just had this small side effect. I mean, it will lead you right off the edge of a cliff if you don't learn to back up, watch it, learn how it functions, and use it when it's useful, but uh, be able to direct your attention towards other sources of uh, uh, living. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. Well, can you sketch out for, for me, for the audience, um, what the steps are of using the ACT modality? Uh, there's six processes and then w one that's um, a kind of a step, and they don't have to be arranged in a particular linear way, different settings or, you know, when you have only a few minutes, you have to do something different than when you have longer periods of time and so forth. But uh, we usually start off with confronting the fact that uh, there's a paradox in the human mind, which is a conscious, deliberate, purposeful control often blows up on us. You know, as I focused on anxiety and trying to get rid of it, it grew, it didn't get smaller, it grew. Well, that doesn't seem right. Almost anything else in your life, if you focus on something and you, you put your best effort to it, it gets better. But not in the world within, uh, that when we're dealing with these aspects of our own uh, history. Um, so that's usually part of uh, this first step, is sort of starting where you are and, and letting life teach you because the mind tells you more the same, more the same, something different, a little more, better, I need to do the same thing. Uh, you know, figure out how to get rid of it, get rid of it. That's often not what you need to do. You need to change your relationship with your own history and with uh, those of uh, others around you. And that's a subtle move that isn't obvious to the human mind. Then inside the work, if we can kind of clear away more of the same is not going to work, uh, we try to take these pathology processes, we cluster them around this concept of psychological inflexibility, which is a combination of avoiding your emotions, becoming entangled in your thoughts, having your attention be rigid, either unable to focus or 
you know, unable to shift your focus, catching that there's a sense of uh, self that's behind your eyes that is uh, 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 at the core of consciousness that isn't influenced by what exactly happens and it deeply connects you to others. This perspective taking sense of self or observer self, the kind of thing that uh, folks in a contemplative practice uh, are visiting. And then when we get more flexibility around emotions and thoughts and being in the now, directing our attention towards what we deeply care about, what brings vitality, purpose, meaning to us, and how we can build larger and larger patterns of uh, behaviors, of actual things that we do that are driven by and connected to our deepest values. And so those are the six processes. Uh, in each case, there's a negative side to it, like experiential avoidance. You can flip. When you're teaching people to walk in, become curious, open, kind of feeling on purpose, we call that acceptance. Entanglement, uh, we call it fusion. We flip it, call it defusion. The uh, normal attentional pro uh, pro processes that are rigid and inflexible and tend to go to the past or the future, which is what you do when you have a problem to solve. If you suddenly were lost somewhere, you'd wonder, how did I get here and where am I going? Uh, we do that naturally with problem solving. Instead, we try to bring people into the now. Buying into our stories, this conceptualized self. I'm like this, that person's like that, using a lot of self-judgment, self-blame, shame, and flipping it into this more transcendent self or perspective-taking sense of self. And then uh, being unclear about what you really want and either impulsive or avoidant in your behavior and flipping that into... Uh, values and values-based committed action. So the core of it, though, is psychological inflexibility or flexibility. And when you try to measure these things, you find out that they all go together and they relate one to the other. And they're, they're not six distinct processes. They're a set of related processes. And um, increasingly, we're linking all of that to an evolutionary perspective, which simplifies it in a way, because no system evolves without variation. No system evolves without selection. And then you have to retain what works. And so the variation part of uh, cognitive and emotional and behavioral openness, the fitting it to context with the attention to the now, and then selecting on the basis of your values and building on the basis of uh, the habits that you create through the actions that you take that are linked to your values, are just in a way um, scaling evolutionary principles that apply to genetics, epigenetics, that apply to cultures, they apply to you too. And um, uh, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. And a lot of folks come in asking for coaching, basically asking for the validation that if I keep doing what I've been doing, I'll get something different, and that's just not going to happen. I love the concept of inflexibility and flexibility, and I can see you presenting that to somebody and how, surprisingly, it's a new idea. It is. because Well, part of it is because we've turned our behavior over to our logical mind, and our logical mind runs more like a train on tracks. And it, it is is a very wonderful tool, but for everything other than the things that are outside of it. And it's a horrible tool. And the logical part of us, uh, this more analytical, judgmental, problem-solving part of us, isn't the whole of us. And so we need to bring other modes of mind, if you want to use that, point of view. I'll give, I'll give you an example that everybody knows about. If you look at something that's beautiful like a sunset, it's very rare for us to sort of get into, yeah, but it needs a little more pink over there and a little more blue over there. You just wouldn't do that. You would rapidly do that with your relationships. You'd do that with your emotions. You'd do that, you know, you're a little more of this and more of that, more of that. It's kind of critical, judgmental, which only shifts your attention towards things that may be uh, you know, you need to do a little more time uh, sort of visiting this sunset mode of mind and literally uh, stopping to smell the roses. I mean, literally stopping to smell the roses. And uh, that's where joy, connection, vitality, and purpose that resides. It doesn't reside inside this critical judgmental mode of mind, which is overused. It's wonderful. I'm glad we can solve problems and project futures and compare alternatives. But if you just live inside that mindy, chattery head space, life has that kind of a heavy and lifeless feel to it. And people don't know how to get out because they literally don't know how to get out of their minds and into their life. 
which is why I titled my book that, by the yeah. way. Yeah, into the, uh, you know, the emotional center and the, and the instinctual centers and to really access all of what's here. It becomes only the head. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's been a, an advice that we received from the wisdom traditions, but also from the deeper psychological traditions. We need to open up and access a larger range of things that, you know, if you wanted to put a word to it, you might say it's more intuitive. You might say also that it's more relational and connected and situated and a little harder to just be uh, uh, put it into verbal categories uh, quickly. What I think we're doing is taking the wisdom traditions and some of the deeper clinical traditions and trying to find uh, through Western science methods these core psychological processes that the way I usually say it in the setting like this is the 10 or 20 percent that of change that will produce 80 or 90 percent of outcome change and, and quality improvement, that's what you want to do. And I, uh, so we end up sort of pulling things at its joints and we don't simply have to, for example, um, tell people that they have to attend 10 day silent retreats and it's fine, it's fine and I've, I love uh, contemplative practice and meditation retreats but the factory of the worker on the, the factory floors is not going to do it. They don't do it in the, in the eastern countries either. And we're trying to, you know, like drive this gigantic Cadillac through these little back alleys of uh, the, the kind of the world as it is. And I want things that in a minute or ten minutes, you know, can open up a vista for somebody. Not in the same way, of course, that a really deep dive into the contemplative traditions would do, or into depth-oriented Psycho, psychological and a work. number of those people will choose that, but the vast majority Yeah, and can't. it's great. It's great, and it's actually in our protocols. I mean, contemplative practices and about 30% of the protocols that are act-based protocols because it's a natural ally. But the, the point here is, is that the idea that we need to open up and to take more time to feel, to be, to just allow ourselves to show up consciously in situations to connect with others and be a little less mindy and judgmental. That's been in the water as long as we've had, uh, uh, you know, behavioral sciences interested in human complexity. But often they don't quite tell you how to do it. And if you try to do that in a mindy way, you end up being, oh golly, you know, I'm not doing it right, or yeah, I'm doing a great job meditating today. Well, no, you're not. I mean, at the point at which you buy into that repertoire, it doesn't matter how you get there, you're no longer in control, you're an automatic pilot. And so we have a set of methods, some of which are very short, and we have a large worldwide community that's involved in developing those methods that will open that door and give people kind of a reliable way in. And that's one thing we do bring to the table. I mean, it's not, it, isn't, it isn't just the 100 randomized trials, I'm proud of that or the 100 or so longitudinal and uh, assessment studies. But it's things like we have more mediational studies on how our methods work than uh, any other approach. I'm sorry to say that. I key to Steve on the idea that there is actual method here. Yes. I can learn it, I can understand, I can read your trials and believe that it's true, but if you don't teach me how to do it... Yeah, exactly. Well, and what it, here's what it gives you. The mediation piece and the component piece gives you a target that's proximal and reliable. So, for example, in a coaching uh, session, um, you know, our uh, flexibility measures in the workplace, there's some that we developed that are specific to the workplace, will, over longitudinal studies, account for a significant chunk of things, whether or not your staff can learn new software or new methods of working together, whether or not they're going to be able to, to sell your products, whether or not they're going to leave your work site, whether or not they're going to be distressed. And the problem is, is that a lot of the things we do, uh, we're not going to know whether or not they work unless uh, we see the outcomes change, but sometimes it's a misdirect. Uh, so for example, people will say they feel better when they avoid things. As a panic disorder person in recovery, I can tell you exactly how that works. I mean, you've got this scary thing, and you, uh, uh, you know, okay, I'm not going to do that. Whew, by me, all you want really... is for the for the scary part to go away. Yeah, you don't care where it yeah, goes. Yeah, but you're actually going backwards. <laughs> you feel like you're going forwards because yeah. anxiety was there, and that's not there. We're going forwards, and now you're going backwards. And sometimes these things don't show up for a period of months. Really, you can fool yourself for a pretty long time, and so can organizations, so can teams, so can communities. So. These flexibility concepts, conversely, are sort of like 
being able to have uh, uh, water and light reach the ground if you're trying to help something grow. I mean, you no, know you don't see the plant leap out of the ground like Jack and the Beanstalk, but you know the conditions for growth are there. And sometimes, initially, things actually go in the opposite direction. We have studies where we've changed the processes and people actually become dysregulated and it looks like they're going backwards and they're not going backwards. They're, you know, in, in the same way that if I gave you a dirty glass that was encrusted with crud and I said clean it, the immediate effect of disturbing it is going to be you've got more dirt in the glass and it's all now in solution and, and it looks like you're going backwards. And in the same way, when you stop and face things that you've been running from or self-objectifying about, initially that can seem like now I've got more problems. No, really, now you have the conditions for progress. And so we have given to the community, and it's a larger community, not just the ACT community, or the, the CBS, uh, group, uh, Contextual Behavioral Science Group, just to the behavioral scientists who are interested in helping people. Processes and measures that are reliable predictors of change. And just within the last five years, for example, CBT in the mental health side of things, We've been searching for, trying to figure out why does CBT work. It's beginning to look at as though it works in part because of these processes that we've developed. It's just that people didn't know it. So, for example, the diffusion process of learning to back up from your thoughts and be able to just watch them. Traditional CBT thought, no, what you needed to do is detect, challenge, dispute, and change, and it never worked as a mediator. I mean, it was the, the, the trail of failed studies was you know mile long. Well, now we start. They're starting to take our ideas of diffusion instead of cognitive change, and sure enough, some of the things they've been doing work when they work, because it's empirically you know, validated treatments. Of course, traditional CBT works. It works because of this kind of backing up, this sort of mindfulness-based process. Now that you know that, you can target it more directly. And whether you call it ACT or not, frankly, I don't care. Call it whatever you like. Let's develop new methods. Our point here is not to uh, you know, have winners and losers, and our point is to help people. And uh, people can take that and change it and relabel it, and, uh, and we'll support that in, in the, the community that we've built. Whether people are inside or outside, it's fine. So uh, I'm excited about that, that there's something that will be lasting, I think, in the RFT work and the psychological flexibility work, even after ACT is long forgotten. Or, yeah. If, uh, if our coaches want to take a deep dive and learn this to a deep level, what do they do? Well, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, trainings going on worldwide. If you go to contextual psychology or contextualscience.org, either name will take you there. You'll see that association, and they always have the list of trainings. But even without those kind of trainings, there's about 60 books on ACT in English right now, uh, uh, and it grows by several uh, every year. And there's you know, videotapes and, and uh, things that you can uh, access to that are relatively low cost or even no cost, uh, basically. I mean, our society, you can join for 10 bucks and get a journal and all the rest, I mean, 10 bucks. And once you're there, all these protocols, I mean, there's literally a, scores and scores of protocols and tapes and so forth that you can download for free. So we're not in this to make money, we're in this to, to help people. And you can, you can access it very, very easily by uh, connecting with uh, the uh, books and tapes and resources that are uh, out there for uh, low cost. And if you, if you really want to be part of a training experience, there's, there's lots of them going on almost anywhere in, in the world uh, over a year or two time within a short flight or even driving distance, you can get good quality. One of the things that we did with our trainers, that I kind of like, is we have a, a we don't we want to we don't certify therapists because we don't want the hierarchy, we want the flexibility. But we do recognize trainers, and we do it the way through peer review. No money changes hands, other than like 80 bucks for secretarial costs. And uh, we're now about 65 recognized trainers around the world who work on the act uh, work. And I'm happy to have people trained who are not recognized. It's just that there is a peer recognition system. That, and what's inside that is that people know the basic science and they show that they can deliver the methods. But the other thing is at the very end, they sign a value statement, which they will not make proprietary claims linked to this. They won't, make, uh, they won't certify therapists and they'll give away their or sell their protocols at very low cost or for free. 
So we've kind of got it set up in such a way that it's focused on the good of the community and not uh, just on you know building six successful businesses. People do fine. They'll make their money doing trainings and all the rest, but uh, you can access it without a lot of woo-ha and, uh, you know, the fifth level of the seventh certification, which always comes down to, you know, tithing to the founders. Uh, yeah. I, it occurs to me, again, personal interest of mine, that what you're describing and the way that you've set it up is something that a practitioner no matter what kind of practitioner, has to learn to do with themselves and for themselves before they can ever offer it to someone else. And that, to, it personally, to me, is very important. But I think that's what I'm hearing. You know, most of the mindfulness traditions say that, and it is true. This is built on the psychology of the normal. You don't have to be expert at it. You don't have to be like, you know, some guru or something. Mm -hmm. You just have to know these processes are personally important and be exploring them. And the metaphor I usually use, it's like climbing up a, a, a can one side of a canyon and you're looking at somebody on the other side of the canyon climbing up. You can see from there, you know, how they're going to hit an outcropping and it's not, they're not going to be able to go up further unless they move off to this side or that. On your side, you may not be able to see it very well. But as long as you know something about climbing and you're kind of committed to it, uh, that's enough to sort of get you in the game. So we have an advantaged perspective when we look at others, but the sense of, of personal commitment and community that comes from knowing how hard that is when it's your stuff is part of what uh, keeps you from uh, going one up on others and using it as something to judge and browbeat and be so clever and so smart. And uh, It humanizes the work that we do. So in ACT training, usually, if you come in and you do, a, 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 for example, we have a thing called boot camp that's four, four days long. The first day is going to be experiential and personal. And that gives you a ground. And then we'll get into the model and we'll get into the techniques. And then we'll get into practice and we'll get into skills development. But we have to build it on a foundation that humanizes uh, the work that you do. And you're in there just as another human being. And when it's your, your stuff, it's hard. And that allows you to be more compassionate and a little softer uh, when you come in and you see people all bound up and you can see a way forward for them, but you can be a little gentler and uh, you know, a little more hum human about how you interact with others who are struggling. It's, it's really wonderful. I'm, I'm uh, exceedingly fascinated, interested, and impressed. <laughs> it takes a lot there for me, but um, I really thank you. I think that what I'm hearing is something that's of enormous value to everybody that comes into this community. It's just, there's, there's values and there's heart and there's humanism and there's, it's all built in there and I can feel it from you more. You know, I can hear it and I yeah. understand it in my head, but I can feel it. Well, people will find if they get around the community, they will feel it. It's just like, you know, feeling water if you jump into a pool, that people are sort of open and accessible they're not a, all about me, 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 or uh, you know, hanging on. You know, they're giving, sharing, and one of the things I do want to say, just specifically the coaching community, that although ACT came out of CBT and the mental health community, because we never bought into this syndromal uh, and kind of more pathologizing of people, and we really wanted to put it wherever human lives need these processes you will find a body of work and a community that will support you in exploring and ap applying that body of work. And so in those 100 randomized trials, it's not just depression, anxiety, substance abuse. You're, you're going to find things like uh, you know, how you can help workers be more effective or, or less stressed, or how can, you can empower uh, leaders, or how you can work in the healthcare system to help people uh, face the behavioral challenges of physical disease. Uh, and using methods that are not just psychotherapy, but are uh, uh, books and uh, smartphone apps and phone call protocols and uh, groups and peer groups and graded levels of, uh, of uh, stepped care kind of interventions. And so there's a pretty big area to explore. There's a special interest group of coaches uh, inside our society, and there's uh, books and so forth that are specifically focused on coaches. So it's really not a hard jump like it would be in lots of areas of, uh, that came out, that touched the psychotherapy world 
where everything is, seems very uh, hierarchical and you have to have the right credentials and uh, who are you to do this kind of work and plus the whole thing is bound up with categories that are syndromal and so forth that make it hard to understand. How would you take that into a work site or how, can, how does that apply to work you know, to teams being affected or things like that? And uh, so I guess I'm just saying the coaching community will find a welcome a welcoming and uh, empowering uh, attitude towards uh, towards others who uh, know about this work. It's something you can access, and you you never have to sort of check your mind at the door or feel as so, though you have to become a different kind of professional in order to be able to, to access and this the work. Word that, the word that comes to me is uh, accessible. It's accessible, open, and uh, sharing. So uh, we welcome any opportunity to be of use.